Hello, everyone, and welcome into the round one recap, round two preview show for the United States Disc Golf Championship live from the Championship Village. I'm your host, Hunter, joined as always by Trevor. Before we get too much into the show, I do want to briefly mention that as we're recording this, between when we're recording this and when it gets posted, round two of Throw Pink Women's will have already happened. So therefore, we're only focusing on the USDGC right now because round two of, US, of Throw Pink Women's is going on on the course. Uh, so let's get straight into the round one scores. Joel Freeman came out the gates pretty hot, shooting up 10 under par in the lead. And then we have Sullivan Tipton, Kyle Klein, and Robert Burridge all tied at nine under. Impressive scores out there yesterday. Yeah, and like you mentioned, Joel technically didn't come out the gates super hot. It took him a while, but got that eagle on hole 10 and from there just exploded. We did see quite a few people score well yesterday with the conditions. Uh, definitely some names we might not have expected, but you know, there's always that chance day one of USDGC if you get hot and are throwing it well. It was scorable yesterday. Well, yeah, as you mentioned, some of the names that we didn't expect are at the top and some of the names that we did expect I won't, I won't say struggle because they're very much still in this tournament. Four rounds, a lot of golf left. But we have Calvin Heinberg sitting a few strokes back at six under. We have Simon Lazad, Isaac Robinson at five under, and Eagle McMahon at four under. All pretty heavy favorites coming into this event, all sitting a few strokes back. But like I said, still really solid chances. Yeah, we were finding, I think, yesterday that a lot of people's rounds were really taking place on that back nine. We were seeing the front nine, just an opportunity for people to kind of get their feet wet, settle into the round. <clears throat> some early struggles for certain players. Uh, some people did come out hot, like Robert Burridge. But a lot of players, almost their whole round was being decided on that back nine, whether that was bleeding a few strokes or like Isaac Robinson birdieing uh, almost all of the final holes to kind of pull around together and get back in it. Yeah, and you briefly mentioned this, but I really want to park on it for a second because Joel Freeman needs a lot of respect for what happened on that back nine. Yeah. We've seen this before. We've talked about it in years past where – Players, he came out two under through the front nine. He gets to hole 10. That eagle on hole 10 really gives him a lot of momentum. And then he birdies everything in sight until he gets to hole 18. Unfortunate OB on 18 ends up with a bogey there to end out his round, but still seeing a 10 under. Now, right behind him, a round that I think really needs to be looked at is Kyle Klein here. He was able to shoot nine under with three OB shots and only 78% C1X putting. Yeah. That's a guy who is a dangerous player out there right now. Yeah, throwing the disc really well. You look at his scorecard, and it is incredibly colorful. Uh, only three pars on, on the round the entire day. Somebody who obviously has experience playing well out here, lost to a playoff just a few years ago to Paul McBeth. Um, but certainly, certainly a good round. And he giving himself a lot of opportunities, and that's all you can really ask for because – this is a course where there's a lot of holes that you just might not get in position to score often. You have to just, you're going to see a lot of chip ups from 110 feet for your pars, especially on some of those holes in the back nine. I think about 11, 12, 13 is some difficult holes to attack. Uh, so anytime you're giving yourself that many chances to score, it's just you're one step away from really putting together a solid round. Yeah, because I think that's when you're looking at day one. That's one of the key things I like to look at and digest is what player is in contention right there. But you can look at it and say, wow, they left a lot of strokes on the table. And the three OB shots, you know, from like Joel Freeman, I think he only had one. There were several players out there with zero or two. The three OB shots is one thing to look at. And then also a lot of Kyle Klein's uh, missed putts came early in the round. I think he missed one on one and on two inside C1X. So that 78 C1X percentage, that's kind of uncharacteristic from Kyle, especially yeah. when he's in contention. So I definitely expect that to pick up um, as his momentum picks up. And being able to still be in contention at nine under one off the lead, that means we could be looking at some really hot scores from him down the stretch. Certainly, and yeah, and also with the with the wind being down yesterday and still hanging in there with a bad putting performance, if you're throwing well, if the wind ever does decide to pick up, then that's all you really need because putting will become less of a separator if it does get a little breezy out here. Now, a player who I personally one of my favorites. I think he's going to be in contention this week, um, but he came out a little flat. He's one of my favorites out here for this tournament. We just talked on the preview show about he has, a, I believe it's since 2015, a top 10 streak. Ricky Wysocki, only two under for this opening round. Now, this is not time to panic if you're a Ricky fan. He's fine for now, but he's had his off round for this tournament. You yeah. can't afford to have multiple off rounds, so he's definitely going to have to get something going over the next three days, but like we said, he's eight strokes out of it three rounds to go, that's a normal Pro Tour event. Yeah. And we've seen Ricky beat some of the guys at the top by eight strokes across three rounds plenty of times, so no need to panic yet. Yeah, well, you said it. You 
you know, if two under is going to be your slow round for the event, that's not a big deal. You know, you kept it under par at this point. I think if you're still under par, you're still in this tournament. That is for sure. And if you look at his round, it was quiet, but there wasn't any blow ups. I don't think he took worse than, yeah, he didn't take worse than a single bogey and it took until the final three holes to even make any of those. So you're just looking at a round where he wasn't getting in scoring position. He wasn't capitalizing when he did. And that's not a sign to be panicking about. That just means he's got to correct a few things and it would not be surprising to see him flip it completely on his head shooting eight nine under today well no especially because looking at his round one of the things that stood out like we were just looking at kyle's ob strokes four ob strokes from rick yeah uh that alone puts him at six under and mm -hmm. six under you're very much in it like we were saying from calvin for instance at six also you know simon isaac two guys that we love at five there as well um but the scoring conditions I think aren't going to really go anywhere. It no. feels like today the wind's down again. The rain should be moving out. We should have already seen it this morning. And by the time they're teeing off, it should starting to be starting to get sunny. And when I was looking at the predicted winds, it's saying like two miles an hour. Yeah. So we should be seeing a lot of scoring conditions again. And it seems like that's going to stick for the weekend. So this could be a very hot, very low scoring USDGC. Yeah, I do think it is a testament to this course and just how difficult the OB is because we've seen a lot of other courses, even ones that do lean a little on OB, be uh, just get absolutely shredded when the wind dies down and while we did see some some players score well we saw a lot of really talented players just get demoralized by the out of bounds Gannon Burr is an example only shooting one under yesterday just bleeding strokes down the finish it just doesn't let up at any point and it's just tight I mean some of the landing zones out here are so difficult when I think about um Hole 11, 12, that stretch there, really difficult spots to land. And hole 18, such an intense drive and upshot there. And we're just seeing that continue to apply the pressure throughout the day. You know, having hit a triple Mando on 15, it, it's just no let up. And guys are going to lose strokes. And I think that shows just how difficult this course is. 10 under being the hot rounds and taking an insane performance on the back nine that probably probably won't see the rest of this tournament um, just to get that hot round and, and so many talented players because I feel like the biggest pack of dangerous players is sitting around four, five, six under. That's kind of the the pack to watch right now, kind of trailing the leaders. I fully agree. The uh, you actually, I just put two and two together when you were saying it, but I think part of what plays into this is that stretch you were mentioning. The time it comes in the course is typically the time when you lose focus in mm -hmm. a round because you're coming out the gates, you're very focused going into the round. Obviously, you just warmed up, you just went through your whole routine. You come out the gates, and there's some tough holes in yeah. the opening stretch, but you're focused, you're locked in, you're excited. It's easy during that stretch. To to go OB on five, shake it off, be like, it's okay, a lot of golf left. Yeah. Once you get to hole you know, 10, 11, 12, 13, there's some very sneaky holes. Hole 13 was that pin location from yesterday. It's going to switch up today, but that pin location yesterday, Ruthless. very tucked in yeah. back there, very tight. That's the part of the round where a lot of times you do lose focus yep. because then once you get out of there, you get over to 15, you can see the finish line, your mind starts to get ready to, to end the round out. I think that is exactly what you're talking about where that stretch is kind of underrated because – for, as a fan, I feel like it, if you're on the ground, it's kind of tucked it, in that back corner. It's it further away yeah. a little, yeah. You don't really, like, not everyone travels out yep. there. But even on coverage, like, that's the part of the round where sometimes I'm like, all right, it's a snack break. I'm, I, a, I'm not going to really pay attention to this part. It's seriously, like, I, I'm, I'm saying that I think that 10, 10, 11, 12, 13 is the, probably the most important stretch on this course, at least at this point in the tournament. Obviously, towards the end, that final stretch will become more important. Um, but it's just so hard to make birdie on those holes. Well, 10... 10 is a key one because yes. it's how you can get your momentum going into exactly. that stretch. A lot of players are looking to turn their round, uh, you know, on the, flip it around essentially. You know, yesterday I was following Brody's card and he was plus two going into the hole. Eagle would have meant everything at that point. Um, and he had to, you know, scramble for par. And luckily he was able to play the next two well, but you saw Joel Freeman get, hit, get it going at that point. Um, I think I remember Gannon when he won last year that, that stretch was very big for him catching up to Antela, uh, just being able to navigate those holes and make pars because there's just no let up. I mean, the landing zones on 11 are super difficult off that tee. Uh, and then 12, trying to attack that green in two is near impossible. 13, where that pin was yesterday, I mean, I don't know how many birdies it saw, but it couldn't have been many because that was just an impossible upshot. So just surviving that station. And then, you know, the funny thing about that finishing stretch is, 
from 14 on, you have holes that are quite birdieable as far as the distance and, you know, the shot that it requires. But the OB is so tight, you know, it's really a flip-flop. It's like a yeah. birdie bogey swing almost. No, very much so. Now, we've been talking about pins a lot during this, especially the one on 13. We're seeing them switch for these next two rounds. They're going to be in the B pins a little bit easier. They're technically 100 feet shorter overall. Not every hole sw switches, yeah. um, but it will make the course play a little bit softer. Are we expecting the hot round to push beyond that 10 under? Or do we think about 10 under is going to be stay there? I, honestly, on this course, I think it's difficult to to really expect anybody to play that perfect for an entire round. Uh, I mean, like even with Joel, it wasn't until the back nine that he had to pile it on to get there. I, I would it wouldn't shock me to see an 11 or a 12 pop up on one of the days where you have a few of the holes with the easier pins because they do make quite a difference. Uh, like 13, in theory, should be significantly easier. Uh, but, yeah, I would I would say, like, it wouldn't surprise me to see a 12 out here from somebody, but nothing better than that. Yeah, no, I, th I think the same thing. It's just so hard to not well, make what's, bogeys. What's tough is if you combine the start Robert Burridge had with the finish yeah. Joel Freeman had. Yeah. You got, I mean... 15, 16 unders out there. It's yeah. just near impossible to actually put that many it, holes together in a it's row. It's crazy. And, well, like, Robert Burge's round yesterday, what you saw was, I mean, and I was following him, just complete control. And when you're throwing the disc under control and you're really working, he was making the course look really easy on that front nine. He was just putting the disc where it needed to go. He was executing his shots and getting pretty easy looks for birdie. But as quickly as it starts, it, you know, they brought, they brought out the Pro Tour cameraman to catch his hot round, and then it just kind of fizzled out. Uh, and it wasn't like he was doing anything terrible. It's, it can just be small margins, little mistakes, uh, some missed putts, and, and it can just all of a sudden that birdie streak doesn't just turn into a bunch of pars. And that's kind of what his round did. And I think that's almost what you have to do on this course is get a hot stretch at some point during the round, just like for five, six holes, rattle off some birdies, and then just kind of sit there. And you have to be okay with that, knowing that that's going to drag yourself to the finish line. You can't expect to just stay hot the whole round it's really not going to happen no i think what what makes this course sometimes frustrating or draining is i was, I was talking to luke callahan's dad um before luke teed off yesterday and i was asking him how he felt and the way he described the course kind of put it all together of he was saying he feels really confident because it's just a bunch of stock shots oh yeah and that's very true it is the shots it's asking these pros to throw are never that demanding it just asks no. you to throw so many of them and you can't let up on any of them Absolutely. because the ob comes into play so quick there's roll away potentials there's mandos there's something to think about on every shot and then the second you do mess up especially if you have a good round going it can just just pump the brakes and next thing you know you can see it all fall apart down the stretch very yeah. quickly oh yeah there's plenty of hyzers on this course and, and you know you're gonna have a few you know backhands there is what there is is on those hyzers you do need to have really good distance control uh a lot of holes you know hole five crossing the water you got hole 11 trying to hit your landing zone hole nine uh the former mozzarella stick hole now the christmas tree hole trying to uh you know, Brody yesterday threw a great hyzer, perfect line, but was just deep. There's a lot of skinny landing zones on those hyzers. So that's just a skill that is kind of underrated is the ability to throw a hyzer out there, but be able to know on your stock hyzers how far you're going to land because it's very tight on those shots. But, yeah, until you get yourself in trouble, and then that's a whole other thing because you've got to <laughs> scramble with that OB around, you are throwing a lot, of, a lot of stock shots. Anybody who has a really good pushing hyzer forehand and backhand is going to succeed. Now, with the lead being from players that are a little bit, we'll call it less experienced playing in that lead position, where do you expect the lead to be after today's round? So we're at 10 under going in. How much is that getting pushed today? Yeah, I, I do like Joel in this tournament. I'm not sure if I like him to win this tournament, but I still think he's very capable and could shoot well today. Again, uh, Kyle Klein is another one that comes to mind. And because you have some of those guys up there, and then because you also have guys like James Proctor, Matty Yo. Uh, and then closely behind them, you have Heimberg, Anthony Barella. Like, there are guys lurking, guys that could shoot an 11 or 12. I, I wouldn't be surprised to see the lead push up close to, mm, let's say, 18 or 19 under after today. I was thinking a little lower. I, my head was between, like, 16, 17. I'll just go with 17 under because um, I think I, I don't expect – Joel or Kyle to just fall off the face of the earth. Yeah. I expect them to put up a solid round today. Um, but I would be – my mind would be a little blown if I saw Joel go back-to-back 10-10. -back yeah. um, I almost like Joel, if he can get himself – this is obviously would not be your goal because you're in the tournament, you're in the lead, you want to stay in the lead. But if he can get himself to where he's in third place – or fourth place, maybe even gets just on to chase card over the next two days. I almost like him better in that position for the chance to win than trying to go wire to wire. Yeah. Um, 
And a similar thing with Kyle Klein. I think Kyle has a little bit more experience um, in these positions to where, you know, he could hold on to it a little bit more. But I, I'm kind of thinking 17 under, which when you're talking like that, when you're thinking like that, now we're only asking Calvin to shoot an 11 under. But if Calvin shoots eight under, he's at 14. Even if the lead gets to 18, yeah. we're four back with two to play. Oh, yeah. Um, that's how much these players are in it. And going back to Rick for a second at two under, if he's able to put up 10 under today, even if that lead gets to 20, we're still only eight back with two to play. Yeah. It gets much more manageable. You just Ricky needs to be close to that hot round today. Uh, and to wrap this whole thing up, what player do you think right now is the most dangerous out there, or players, if you want to touch on multiple? Um, honestly, I mean, Kyle Klein at 9-under is pretty, is pretty scary, especially as a guy who did you know, almost win this tournament. I think he's one to look at. But, yeah, I immediately look to that pack that is sitting at, at, at six, five, and 4. Um, Isaac Robinson is sitting in there. Calvin Heimberg. Chris Dickerson is sitting in that pack. Anthony Barella. Simon Lazat. Like, there's just so many names. James Conrad, another former winner, sitting at 5-under. And then in the 4, you also have Eagle McMahon that's lurking there. Um, Adam Hamez is a solid player lurking in there as well. So I look at that pack, and that's where I feel like one or two of those guys today – is going to shoot a really good round, going to launch themselves up in towards the lead. And and then at that point, you know, moving into Saturday and into the weekend, we're going to be looking at those guys as our favorites. But would not surprise, like, I really do expect Joel Freeman to hang around. And he, you know, he hasn't been a name that's been in conversation as much this year as formerly. But I got to say, I, I don't hate the idea of Joel Freeman taking this thing down. I think he is a player that could take it, uh, could take this down. And it would be a huge win for his season, certainly. Oh, a huge win for the career. I mean, the USDGC, yeah. like, there's only, what, 13 champions so far in Not 24 many. years, yeah. 25 years. Um, the Kyle, that, or the, wow, spoiler, the player that I like the most right now is Kyle <laughs> Klein. The Kyle. Um, mainly, like, I, I talked about it for extended period at the beginning, but just seeing the score he was able to put up with obvious strokes left out there, I really like his chances to be able to put up a few more good rounds. Um but I, like you were saying, there's so many different players that I think can get into contention and will get into contention. Um, and Isaac Robinson, what I will say, the fact that he got hot late, and he seems like a momentum player a lot of times where yeah. it almost feels like, especially we've seen him go wire to wire a few times, where it feels like once he gets hot, he doesn't cool off. Yeah. So the fact that he ended his round out on that high note, that could be dangerous for the course of the day. He could come into this thing with a full head of steam yeah. and just run right through it. And we might be looking this weekend at like, wow, Isaac all was, of a sudden has a five-stroke lead. Yeah, I was a little nervous when he started out so slow yesterday and he was just kind of struggling to get opportunities, not not having a lot of demand or command over the disc. But after that finish yesterday, definitely still feeling pretty confident about Isaac Robinson. He certainly has every opportunity. You know, as I look through the leaderboard, though, there's still so many guys that are farther down the leaderboard that still do have a chance. I, I, honestly, though, as I look at it, and, you know, when, I, when the rounds first were finished yesterday, I was kind of thinking, okay, probably my line is, you know, maybe plus one, plus two for, you know, guys that are still in this thing. Obviously, anything can happen. But as I look at it now, really, realistically, I see Cole Rodallin and Gannon Burr at one under, and that kind of those guys kind of round out where I feel like you know the guys in contention still are. Very early in the tournament, a lot can happen. But when I think about guys that could claw their way back into this, those two pop into my head immediately. Looking back on the leaderboard, but there are still good players that are a few over par. That who knows? This is going to be a big day for them because I will say, if you are that far back, the time's up. You got to do it today. No, yeah. There's the as much as there is a lot of golf left. There's not that much golf left in, if you're at two under, yeah. one under. You've you got to get out here, and you got to get – honestly, in my opinion, if one of the guys, Ricky, Gannon, Cole, one of the two under, one under guys, if they want a chance at winning this, you got to be double digits today, yeah. in my opinion. Well, because the bottom line is those leaders are going to keep pushing. Yeah. There's too many talented golfers that are you know six under and better that they're going to keep going, so you can't just expect the rest of the field to collapse – you know, those guys that are stuck back a ways are going to need multiple double digit rounds, you know, to finish out this tournament for sure. So that's it's going to have to start today. I'm sure of it. Well, there you have it. That wraps up everything that happened during round one and hopefully gives you enough storylines to follow going into round two out here. If you're anywhere close to the Charlotte area, I highly recommend getting out here, getting on the grounds, watch it for yourself. But if not, you're sitting at home. Be sure to tune on Disc Golf Network and watch it all go down live. And we'll be back here same time, same place tomorrow to let you know what happened today and give you all the storylines you need.